And um, so in the summer of 2007, I arrived to Berlin. And uh, it was after uh, creating uh, um, a big series of works, a big series of works uh, following Hannah Arendt. Actually, it was, uh, I read the book of Hannah Arendt, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, a report about banality of evil. And it was very, very strong and thrilled. And uh, I decided that I want to do something with that. And I started to work and I created a very big series of works, uh, which mostly was portraits of her through all kind of uh, uh, years, uh, uh, from young age to old, and um, also things that related to her uh, writings and ideas and so, and it was presented in, uh, in Frankfurt, in the Swedish Museum, and all kinds of other things. So when I arrived to Berlin, I was already very into uh, this uh, uh, German issues. And uh, um, so I, I will, that, that was uh, the first one of the works that uh, from the Hannah Arendt story, it was a, a, a very big story. And when I came to Berlin, I, uh, do you hear me well, by the way, and seeing the images? Yes, perfectly. It's all perfectly. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> succeeded. I'm sorry about all that. So, uh, so there were a few things that when I came to Berlin were uh, very influential. One was uh, actually my attraction to neoclassical art, because as you know, in Israel, we don't have so much neoclassical art. Or building, so, and it's also concerns that uh, there is religious aspect that it's in a way forbidden, so it's, it's also working. And there is, uh, it is really the moment, very modern state. So it's grew up on modernism, more on conceptual art, minimalist, abstract. So I have something as an artist that I really miss this uh, uh, neoclassical or this kind of thing that people are, uh, in Germany maybe they don't look at them uh, uh, so well. Uh, deeply or very fascinated as I was. And so there was this point, there was the, um, the technique I used in the Hannah Arendt pro, pro, uh, project, a technique that it's, uh, I'm burning the wood and through the burning, creating uh, the images, it's called the uh, electric etching. It's a kind of a loot carbon that, uh, so it really fit me to the, uh, to the ideas of destruction and building also concerning Hannah Arendt life and writings. The third thing was uh, um, this wood OSB that I liked very much because it looked to me very intense and very and fits also to the uh, to this chaotic world that I wanted to deal with. So after a very short period I started to work in this actually three aspects also the loot carbon, the wood and the German uh, monuments, motifs, sculptures, and through them, I try to understand the German history or what's happened in the Second World War. I mean, how it came to this radical, so radical process. I mean, this process came to radical terms and how it functions. It's, I, I had a feeling that I need to understand something because it's not, a, you can always say many things, but it's, you know, it's people, it, there is processes. So I, so I went to the German history and not to uh, Goebbels, Goering, Himmler, and so on, to the Prussians, to ancient times, to uh, Middle Ages, and through that I tried to, to my, I call it my, because it's a uh, private perspective, and I call it a Martian, because I use this motive of a legend story. So, uh, so I started with the uh, uh, quadriga that I was really fascinated by a uh, beauty and, uh, and I burned it on the woods. Uh, many sculptures, as I said, has been destructed. So, so I, I don't know if you know, but it, the quadriga in the Brandenburg Gate was severely damaged and it was created in the 18th century, the aid of end of the 18th century. But thanks God, there was a, they found the model. So they created, 
a new quadriga. Now, also something that's important to mention, this, this Prussian Welt, it's uh, following our subject, anti-Semitism and law, that I'm not, you know, I'm not really into that, but as we spoke, me and Reut and, uh, and uh, Alexandra, many things appeared in this world that concerned anti-Semitism, but it was, uh, let's say, classical anti-Semitism. It was all the time dialogue, relationship. If it was Bismarck with his Jewish friend, the banker or jewelers, or later on, uh, if it was Friedrich mit uh, Ephraim, uh, eine, uh, Ephraim, eine, the, the, there is the Ephraim Palais, he was a jeweler and a banker. So there is many Jews around in all this story and there is a relationship. The, the, the tragic things in the Second World War that all this dialect has been severely damaged, broken and uh, radically actually in a very radical way. But there is all the time this anti-Semitism, but it's a kind, we can call it a classical, like that we'll see a bit uh, further with the, some of the sculptures. So if I'm creating a, a merchant and there is a wagon and there is an office, so we need a palace. So I choose the uh, Palace de Republic, Stadtschloss, or now it's called Humboldt Forum. Forum. All these places when there is a very complicated dialect in German history or in German Jewish history. And in the uh, Stadtschloss, it was very, in a certain point, I didn't know what to create because I visited. Berlin in 89, and there was the Palace de Republique. And then they demolished it. And then they didn't know what to do for a long time. And then they built this Humboldt Forum. So all the time I visited this place, and then I decided to do something that it's in between. It's like it's burned, it's exploded. Actually, it was in 81. It was severely damaged the palace, but it was uh, still there was a possibility to renovate it. But now the communists didn't want this Prussian legacy, so they destroyed it. So I used this uh, image as an image of uh, destruction. Um, then I need to, to choose the kings and the queens. All, all was kind of, uh, I didn't know very well the German history, and so it was a kind of a Germany into the German history, German to all kinds of motives, but the, the, the thing that led me was also my attraction to them, my desire, my aesthetic that I liked. But it's, again, it was also my dialect, because in a way I liked it, because, but on the other way, it's Prussian, it's German, it's uh, ended in a catastrophe, so I, I like it, I don't like it. Uh, so I found this uh, expressions in the story. If, if, for example, I choose as a king, Kaiser Wilhelm I, uh, it comes from a sculpture that uh, uh, I was fascinated about in the Köln of the Kaiser. And here you can see the work of uh, Joram Shacha. So there is the king, there is the heir. In this case, also this series is a mixture of imaginary figures like synagogue. I mean, it's not imaginary, but it's kind of unreal figures and real figures. So it's uh, it's uh, interesting, but maybe complicated in a way, because you see, well, it's imaginary, but there is Kaiser Wilhelm and there is Felix Mendelssohn, there is Kaiser Wilhelm der Zweite. It's a, uh, uh, but I tried in a way to make uh, uh, it more sensible. So there is the king, there is the heir, there is the palace, there is the office, and then came the, the courtyard people. And when I thought of the courtyard people, so I took, uh, so co this courtyard, as I said, like, uh, for example, in, with Bismarck and Friedrich, there is all kind of Jews around. And one of the figures that I really was attracted to was synagogue. So it's really symbolizing in a way this complicated dialect between Christianity and Judaism, because synagogue is the uh, incarnation of the Judaism in a woman body, and it appears all the time with Ecclesia, and, uh, but she's blind, she don't see the truth. And in the middle of law, it's interesting, because she looks like the, the, some people told me it's the goddess of justice. I said, no, it's not, because it's a, the goddess of justice. She's blind because she don't, need to see who is appears in front of her 
it is all of are equal. In this case, synagogue is blind. She don't see the truth. The truth is Christianity. So, uh, um, so here we can see uh, synagogue uh, from the Strasbourg Cathedral. Again, all this technique is really burned. So it's something that's uh, like burned in the body. Uh, and uh, here we can see synagogue in the Strasbourg uh, Cathedral with Ecclesia. And this synagogue, I was very fascinated by her because she's very pretty. And you're thinking, well, it's uh, how come that she's so pretty? She's supposed to be something that it's uh, uh, negative. So it's so showing again this complicated dialect because she's she's pretty and she's even sexy. And then it leads me to call her the beautiful Jewish because uh, to the to the, this work that I made because it's a myth. In the, especially in Germany, but not in Europe of the end of the 19th century, the pretty Jewish, the beautiful Jewish, the Belge Juif, or the Shune Yudin, the, the, the Jewish woman that is attractive and uh, mysterious. And uh, so there is like Salome of uh, Richard Strauss. Uh, it's, it's, it's exactly this motive of temptating, uh, but still a complicated dialect. And um, on the clothes of the uh, of the synagogue, I made motives from uh, in Strasbourg. There was also uh, unbelievable, but the synagogue. That's a synagogue. The synagogue in Strasbourg was built like a cathedral with the rosetta and everything. So it's again this complicated dialogue uh, um, or interesting. And it was demolished by the Nazis in 42. All this great building is demolished. And so, so I took motives from the Rosetta and I put it on the clothes of, uh, of synagogue. If you, uh, so that was one of the uh, courtyard people. The second one was the Wanderer, the, the, the Wanderer Jude, again, a, G a German, uh, German Christian motive, quite ancient, from, based on the story of uh, Jesus that, uh, or the Jew, they didn't give him a, a chair to sit or didn't want to ask him while he was in the Via de la Rosa and uh, he cursed him that he will wander. And the figure that I choose, like uh, Felix Mendelssohn, uh, also a very interesting figure, a very talented one, very, very important in the German uh, music world and the, the great son of, uh, the grandson of, uh, Moshe Mendelssohn from the Enlightenment that converting to Judaism to Christianity and uh, dying young. And, and I based it also on this monument that uh, was in the Leipzig of the, in front of the opera that the Nazis demolished in the 36. And in 2008, it was built again. It's, now we can find it in Leipzig. And uh, Again, like being a Jew, if you want a success, you need to convert to Christianity, but your success is very uh, complicated, like we can see with Mendelssohn or later on with Einer. Um, are you accepted? And of course, Wagner, that's right against uh, the Jewish music. Uh, so, so it's always dialect uh, and complicated. Uh, uh, history of trying to be accepted or not trying to be accepted or trying to convert to be accepted and but not succeeding so much through this converting. Um, another figure was Siegfried. Siegfried, uh, so in this courtyard, this the, 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 the German figures or the Jewish figures. And Siegfried, of course, it's a great or important motive in the German history from Wagner, uh, the Siegfried line in the in the first world war and second on, and of course Hitler and Wagner, and I choose the figure of uh, Siegfried uh, through a sculpture that uh, I found uh, by a friend. A friend Matthias is very familiar with Berlin, and I, I looked at him, I visited him, and, he, and I saw this image and said, "Wow, what is it?" And he told me like it's a sculpture that used to be in the Ziegesale. So I, said, I thought Ziegesale. I said Ziegesale. Where in the Ziegesale? I said no, it's a Ziegesale. It's a it's a boulevard that the Kaiser Wilhelm 
the, the Zweite, created in Berlin with many, many monuments. And said, said, okay, and where it's now, he said, I don't know, it's destroyed and the, all the sculptures, the Russians and the Germans shot at each other through the sculptures and the walls and the, the, it was on a small wall. So they were, it was a very good uh, place for shootings in the Battle of Berlin, in the end of the Battle of Berlin between the Germans and the Russians. Um, after a long, long journey, I, my trying to research where is this sculpture, uh, I reached to the, a place which called the Lapidarium in Kreuzberg, Berlin. Uh, and they opened it for me and it was full from all the sculptures of uh, the Zigi Saleh. And I looked further and I found the uh, Irish the skin, but without his hand, without his hand, without his head without his leg, still very, very pretty, still kind of uh, androgyn a bit. And it was, for me, it was like uh, the Nibilungin, this German saga of the, the, the end, all are dying and the fire and everything. So it uh, really fits me to, to Siegfried, uh, Irish the skin. Uh, I took also some motives. Uh, this is, for example, a shield from a prehistoric uh, uh, museum in Charlottenburg that I put uh, on it, the Eisner Kreuz. Uh, still a German motive, historical, that has sense of sensitivity. If I know that there is a problem all the time to, to use it on German tanks and weapons and so, because the Nazis uh, use it. So I choose it. Uh, um, there is this Preussisch uh, Militarismus that people speak about it. That's actually what's led to Second World War, but it's very controversial, I think, all this issue, because as we saw, uh, there was a Militarismus, but still, at least with the, the Jewish aspect, it was uh, uh, much more uh, complicated or interesting or dialectical relationships. Um, here I put all kind of down, down I put motives, uh, Eichenblättern and all kind of German motives on the shield. Uh, then in the legend story, there is the scene of the war that I took from, uh, 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 from a sculpture that used to be survived actually. It was to be in the yard of the Stadtschloss, uh, St. Georg Kämpfen der Drachen. But uh, so it means the Christianity that's fighting the pagans. So, but I, I changed the composition and it's more looks that the pagans are fighting the, uh, or winning the Christianity. And uh, of course I called it the struggle or the camp and it's uh, associative uh, for, uh, for Hitler book. Um, so, so then was the camp, and then there is the, the ruin that it was based on the Alte Bahnhof uh, station, a very pretty uh, in neo Renaissance style station that uh, actually many Jews from Berlin were deported from this uh, station. And uh, but again, I, I really liked this. When I saw first in 89, the Alta Banos, I was with this friend, Matthias, and I thought, oh, what is it? I mean, it's amazing. It's, you know, it's these red bricks and the, the, the gay, the arch and the sculptures. So the sculpture that used to be on the, on the top of the Alta Banos, this is the Alta Banos, was uh, um, this sculpture. The sculptures of the, uh, there was the day and the night. It uh, was a kind of uh, uh, in association with the day of the night of Michelangelo from the Cappella Medici in Florence. And, um, and there were, I also I found them in the Technicum Museum in Berlin, severely, not severely, but very damaged with holes from the bullets and everything. And uh, so I use this image of uh, uh, the night as the uh, Lorelei. Lorelei, the one that's seeing all the catastrophe, the ships that are drowning and uh, attempting them actually in a way to, to, to get closest to the rocks and then drowning. And um, I put the coating 
auf äh, Heinrich Anne und fließt äh, und, flu und ruhig fließt der Rhein. Like she is observing all the catastrophes, but, uh, um, but no one is doing nothing actually. Because it's the catastrophes and people dying and everything destroyed, but it's uh, und ruhig fließt der Rhein. One of the Ruhig Fließt der Rhein, it's uh, one of the works that was in the Alte National Gallery uh, of uh, Alexander von der Mark. It's a prince that has been uh, poisoned, actually, one of the sons of, illegal son of one of the Friedrich. And he created a very big monument that is still today in the Alte National Gallery. And here I quoted uh, Goethe. It's written here, uh, Sei ruhig, bleibe ruhig, mein Kind, in uh, Dürrenblätern, so is it der Wind. Like, um, actually, I must admit that I saw this sculpture, and then I went to the monument of the uh, of Peter Eisenman near the Brandenburg Gate, and I saw a picture of a uh, father taking his son uh, in front of uh, German soldiers to just before they're going to be shot to. And I thought to myself, well, what, what can you do? say to your child in such situation that they're going to shoot you in a few minutes and put you to a big hall. And then came to me this uh, uh, Erkuning of Goethe, the one the, it's called, I'm trying to relax his son. At the end, the, the son died. Uh, the big theory, uh, I, I don't present it today all the world because it's maybe too much, but the big theory ended uh, like in legend stories with the uh, Sof. Der Sof of Yiddish, it's the end. Der, Deutsch, Sof, Hebraish, end. So it's this, uh, this Jewish, German, symbiotic things, the simulation, all the things that come together in this war, in this language that, uh, so many people in the Jewish world spoke, actually, in, in, if it's in America or in Australia or in Palestine, or this, actually they spoke German, a kind of a dialect of an ancient German mixed with Hebrew and Aramaic. So it's, uh, so for me, it was uh, very strong that actually you're saying the sof, the end in Yiddish, the sof, and it was a kind of, uh, a shield that used to be very glorious with uh, very decorative uh, motives and uh, written in a kind of a biblical uh, letters and but it's very neglected very looks like long time was in the in the ground so so that uh, was actually the the end of the theory uh, with this uh, with this shield um so it was a, a very interesting long journey uh, my journey in the german history if mm, trying to understand if i understand things but yes maybe but uh, um of course it's my own personal perspectives uh, that it needs to take, uh, it was a process, but the process at the end leads to, uh, to the catastrophe, but it's, uh, maybe you can find some of the roots there and the Kaiser Wilhelm that which I uh, use as a motive, uh, then turn and also his son in a way uh, uh, during second world war, he was uh, quite radical with the, the thing that he said and his sons became uh, at least one, a Nazi officer or two. Uh, and then when I came back to Israel, I created a big theory which called the uh, Augusta Victoria. It's following the relationship between uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and Theodor Herzl, and the way they try to find a solution to the Jewish problem. Uh, I must say that the, the theory was very, very intense. The technique is very, very complicated to burn all this wood. It's almost cost my life because then I discovered that uh, it's, it's basically a bit on my uh, lungs, but thanks God it's, uh, mm -hmm. it was okay. Um, so, uh, and then I finished to, to create the theory. I tried to show it in Germany. I must admit that it was a bit complicated. I think they didn't like so much the Israeli guy that comes and deals with the 
uh, with the German history and the ancient part of it with Germanicus and all kind of uh, uh, German eras from the histories. And then I brought it to Israel and I presented it here uh, in Herzliya Museum and some other places. And, uh, and Yoram Shachar has one, now Reut has one, and one work, and, uh, and we'll see what will come with all this in the future. But that was my, ah, and, and I didn't say one thing that maybe I need to mention, and it's very important. Uh, when I came to Berlin, so there was this uh, buildings and monuments that the Germans left as a, uh, memorial for the catastrophe, but there was also this Stolperstein, and I think that was very, very important and strong. All the houses that you see, this uh, metal uh, tablets, and uh, the names, it's sometimes like names of Israelis, and sometimes you see uh, many, like eight, six, or seven, and as an artist, uh, I see things. Philosophers usually think, musicians sing, uh, hearing, but artists, visual artists are seeing things. And I all the time saw the people coming, going, going down with the uh, luggage, going to the train, getting to the concentration. I mean, it was a catastrophe. It, because that I created the city actually, because I, I, I had to react to this very sensitivity in a certain way and to understand how it comes, the process leads to this point. Um, so, of course, there is a lot to speak about it, uh, uh, maybe about my uh, conclusions and things like that, but uh, I'm not really a historian, I'm a kind of artist and a bit historian. Um, so, uh, so that's the point, and the, in the matter of our issue, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism and law, um, of course, all the figures that with many figures uh, like uh, Ecclesia and Synagoga and the uh, Felix Mendelssohn and, uh, and other motives are related that, to that in some way or another. Um, so I think I think I will stop here, uh, Alexandra, and. Um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue with what you, because I spoke, I think, too much. Uh, you, we will continue with what you wanted to, uh, to say or to speak. And then we'll have time for questions. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Shai. This was uh, really um, uh, impressive and worth the wait. Um, Alexander, you want to take over? You should uh, unmute yourself and also, yeah, you're, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I hope you can see me. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much for having me for this talk. It's an honor to speak in these Abraham Bar Menachem talks. And um, I thank you, Reut, and I thank also uh, Tilo Maron for inviting me to Gießen, um, which is very dear to me because, of course, I'm a child of Hessen. So I was originally supposed to study in a Hessen university, but then escaped to Franconia. But I visited Gießen many times because one of my close childhood friends became a veterinarian um, at Gießen University. Uh, and I think I've been there for a talk some years ago. Um, I say this also because I recently worked a little bit on the history of the Gießen faculty, which from the 60s onwards was a very reformist law faculty in Germany, experimenting with socio-legal research with people like Helmut, um, Helmut Ritter uh, and others. So there's some tradition for unorthodox approaches to the law. Um, and as Tilo Maron has mentioned, um, to speak about law and art is probably not uh, such a common way to approach um, the law as a practice and as scholarship, but I think it's very useful and fruitful. And it's probably also more doctrinally and more, doc more linked to legal doctrine than it appears at first glance, because uh, art often helps us to discover and to unveil the backgrounds and nuances of our um, legal, uh, legal work and legal study 
in very multiple and deep ways. And it helps us also to reflect about our own stance as lawyers, or also as non-lawyers, uh, towards recent uh, debates in society and also in law and politics. And sometimes it shows us um, nuances and uh, challenges us to ask questions that uh, can not be so easily covered and enshrined in um, more traditional or more orthodox um, legal formats and uh, forms of scholarship. So in that sense, I think law and art is certainly an area which needs to be further explored, probably similar to law and literature. And I'm very grateful that Shai, Labi, uh, Shai Abadi today uh, gave me an opportunity and gives me an opportunity to um, reflect a little bit from a legal perspective on his work. This is also personally um, a, a great experience because I came across Shai's work first uh, some years ago in Berlin in the summer of 2008, when I think he just had completed or was about to complete work on this series. And I remember uh, quite vividly when I've seen these artworks first in his apartment back then. And I was really fascinated by the materiality of these works. And I think the Zoom today transports a little bit the kind of nuances of the material, of this wooden material that Shai um, has worked with in this series. Uh, if you have an opportunity to see some of these works um, in real and not just on a digital screen, someday you will realize that it is really a very vibrant and lively and, and living um, material and has a kind of golden and shimmering uh, reflection. Um, and when Shai told me about how he came across these materials by just finding these wood, uh, wooden plates on a Berlin street, um, I was also fascinated by uh, the way how these materialities um, that were used in renovation works in apartments in Berlin um, prompted his engagement um, with deeper questions of of history and memory that he also encountered during his time in Germany. And looking back on this now and seeing these works again and re-engaging with them, I'm just stunned by the intensity with which these works speak to many of the legal and political discourses we are having today in Germany, but also across the world. So the, the question of uh, the meaning of memory and how we relate to memory and history in society and in law um, is of course very prevalent in many societies when we talk about the significance of monuments and how to deal with them. Um, in Germany, of course, we have recently a major debate about the Hohenzollern and their claim uh, for restitution and repayment uh, of funds. They also are interested to regain some of their properties and in the legal, um, the legal uh, disputes that are currently pending and have been going on for the last seven years or so, um, the question of the, um, the connection or the, the uh, participation of the Hohenzollern family and their active facilitation of the Nazis' rise to power is a core element, but, if, but now it's also a dispute about the relation between history and the law in the sense that um, a number of leading historians, among them Christopher Clark, for example, have been asked to uh, provide expert statements. And now they are also part of the uh, dispute in a sense because the Hohenzollerns uh, are trying to silence uh, the historians who uh, gave um, expert advice. So there are also questions of to what extent um, historical facts can be turned or framed as legal issues and um, to, what, to what extent they should be determining uh, the future um, access also to historical um, cultural goods and historical uh, properties. So 
then of course also the question of monuments and also monuments that are enshrining um, uh, facets and aspects of anti-Semitism are currently uh, under dispute and also part of legal claims and legal disputes in, um, in Germany. And I think uh, Shai's work is very, um, very enlightening in approaching the tensions that lie beneath these disputes. So one of my, um, one of my favorite um, works and the series uh, is certainly the, uh, the Schöne Judin, the Beautiful Jewess, which takes up the narrative of synagogue and ecclesia that has been um, uh, has been uh, has become part of the sculptures of many cathedrals in the Middle Ages, most prominently in Strasbourg, uh, in the pair from which Shai drew the inspiration for uh, his Schöne Judin, um, and it really depicts the the very um, ambivalent uh, relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Um, in that time, of course, was Christianity as the dominating um, part, but it is also part of a story of cultural entanglements during the, or since Roman times, um, up until the 20th century, uh, that is also embodied in art and architecture. And uh, in Strasbourg, for example, the, the, um, the rose window that is also part of the of the Schöne Judin um, appears again in the 19th century synagogue uh, of Strasbourg and also in many places along the Rhine River where you had the eldest uh, Jewish settlements in what became later Germany um, in the Schum cities of Mainz, Worms or, um, or Cologne and Speyer you often have this parallel in architecture between cathedrals and synagogues, often the same stonemasons working uh, on, these, um, the, on these monuments. And then taking this narrative further into the 19th century, into the story of the beautiful Jewess is a really very fascinating example of how narratives are translated, how they wonder, how they are overlapping and how this can be incorporated in an artwork that in itself has so many meanings. Now, another of my favorites is of course the Berliner Schloss, um, which I'm currently um, quite concerned also in my professional role at the Max Planck Institute because it's been the place where our institute was founded in 1924. Um, and uh, where it had its location until the end, the end of the war. The Max Planck Institute for uh, Public International Law was um, by that time or became in the late 1920s a member of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft. And the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, of course, was its institutes also working in the hard sciences, was very close to German government and German politics and an institution that aimed to strive for the dominance of German uh, science on a global level. And also the legal institute was very close to the government and meant to be an institution that could contribute, contribute to Germans um, rise after the end of the first world war. So while we are at the institute preparing for the 100th jubilee of the founding of the institute, we are re-engaging with this history um, the founding in the 1920s, but also the refounding of the Institute uh, in the late 1940s. And of course, also the entanglements that lie between those two, um, two, state, two dates. The Schloss, of course, is also a symbol or has become a strong symbol in recent years for German colonialism. And uh, you, most of you will be familiar with the dispute about the uh, Humboldt Forum in the reconstructed Berliner Schloss. For many people around the world in former colonial territories, um, the Schloss is also, of course, a symbol for the Berlin Conference in 1984, in 1884, sorry, 1885, uh, where um, Africa was divided among the colonial powers. 
Uh, so the Schloss in itself carries that history. And I think the work of Shai um, also offers an entry point into these layers of history and historical events that are incorporated in that building and probably cannot be shown so clearly now in a, in a concrete based um, reconstruction as we see it now. But if we look at these artworks, we can see it very, very clearly. Um, so in ending, um, I think that these works really offer a lot food for thought for lawyers to think about these uh, these nuances of, of um, and the entanglements between history and law, but also of the ambivalent history of our own discipline. Um, and seeing in the end a work like Der Sof, um, which marks an ending, but also has, I think, almost the character of a kind of gate. So there's certainly also in that work a kind of opening to, uh, to a future. Um, we are, of course, reminded of the many uh, excellent lawyers that were um, that, that were killed in the Holocaust or also driven out of the country. Um, and there has been a lot going on uh, also in legal scholarship in the last two decades in recovering these stories and these biographies um, and, to, uh, and to reconnect or uh, rediscuss these um, protagonists in uh, our scholarship and in the workings of um, German, German law as it is taught and researched at universities. And of course, Abraham Ben Menachem, of course, the, the person who uh, is the patron of this series uh, is also an example for that group um, of, uh, of Jewish lawyers um, that can or should be discovered. Uh, and I think also in that sense, um, the, uh, the series offers uh, and prompts a re-engagement with that part of our disciplinary um, history and background that we are challenged, but also we can be honored to, uh, to rediscover and to re-engage with. So thank you very much again, Shai, for prompting me to re-engage with these exciting works. And I'm looking forward to further questions and comments. Thank you so much for, um, for both an, uh, a very um, uh, impressive talk and then uh, impressive and thought-provoking um, uh, comments, uh, Alexandra.